at City Hall in City Council Chambers. So the, the manager has authorized that planning commission to continue to meet, consider zoning variances, and there's an update every meeting on the master planning process, and uh, there is public comment at that meeting as well. Okay, uh, the other question is, do you guys post that on the website, and have you made the decision as to what agency is going to do the master plan? The, the recommendations are are moving their way through to the manager for his approval. So the final decision hasn't been made, um, but the planning commission, based on all of your feedback, those of you who participated in those meetings, they rank the top three. So the top three firms, Housel Levine, Goody Clancy, and Interface Studios, um, were forwarded to the manager for consideration. Okay, I just have one comment, because I was there and I listened to some of them. And some of them, they just had these great presentations. You're sitting there watching it, and it's like, yeah, this is nice, this is gorgeous, boy, boy, this would be great. And then you're like, they're not even from this area. And they're going to leave and, and screw us, like many agencies have done. There are, there was a couple that were from the state of Michigan that I think should be considered, and they were probably cheaper. Our job. Uh all of the proposals following the revised uh, budget request all came in the same. So uh, all the budgets were the same across the board. Our job as a community is to use the consulting resources to make this plan work for us. So you're, you're right that each of those three firms are all headquartered in uh, outside of our community. Uh, each of those three firms and their partners have done work in this community already. Uh, there's some that actually have open work with the city today, with our Department of Tra uh, Transportation and other entities. So they're already here working with us. My approach has been, we want the best in the country to help us work on our problems. Our job is to show up and to be engaged and to make sure that their plans uh, meet our approval. That process has to go through the Planning Commission, which are nine volunteer members of our community, one from each ward, and then it has to be approved by the city council so you know that process and state law is all in place and, and we have to do our job to make it work okay thanks mayor uh, i'm paul jordan um, a couple things you, you made the statement that we need some kind of mechanism to intervene in, in the case of cities where they're in severe financial distress and i'd just like to point out that uh, Federal bankruptcy law that's been in place for since 1937 provides for such a mechanism. It's Chapter 9 bankruptcy, if you're interested in it, do a Google search. Uh, there's an excellent, uh, extensive description of what it involves on the federal court website. I refer anybody to that. There are substantial differences, however, between the emergency manager mechanism of intervention and Chapter 9 bankruptcy. One of those is under Chapter 9 bankruptcy. The judge serves as a facilitator of the process, not as the imposer of a solution. It's different from personal bankruptcy. That the elected officials of the city are not supplanted in favor of a judge or another authority. And that instead of the pressure being on the sale of assets or the extreme reduction, forced reduction possibly of city services, the pressure is on creditors to either reduce the amount of principal, reduce the interest, or extend the extent of the debt, the length of the loan. Whereas under the emergency manager, creditors are largely protected. Now that's, that's an important distinction. Uh, the second thing is that a couple of weeks ago we got four sections worth of the newspaper full of nothing but lists of properties in the rears, for property taxes in the rears. Now that was throughout the county, not just the city. A lot of those were in the city. And anybody who looked through that noticed that an awful lot of uh, the entities that owed the back taxes were banks. And I, I suggest that the city go to the banks that owe the city money and say, we're not going to deposit our money in your bank. We're going to take it out, but you're behind on your bank. And maybe that'll get their attention. <laughs> Some good suggestions there, Paul. 
One thing I'd say about bankruptcy versus public act four is that if the if cities go into bankruptcy, it can impact the credit rating of the county. It can impact the credit rating of the state. So all citizens could begin to pay for that. So if we can avoid that, I think that's a better way to go. But we can we can talk about that more. Thank you. My name is Chris Dermer. I live in Flint, Michigan. Um, you know, we just heard a couple of things. The banks, uh, you know, for the longest time, and I think it might still be true today, but we don't use a local bank for to, to, you know, for our checks. I know we've moved away from issuing checks, but at, certainly at one time, you know, it was an opportunity to promote Flint and do business in Flint, but yet we were going outside of the city, outside of the county to or some of our banking. Um, in regards to that master plan, I, I sat in on both, both those meetings when the uh, presenters gave those uh, presentations. And then I was at the planning commission meeting when they were trying to decide which three to go with. And there was a problem in the decision as to who to pick because of the bid process. So, as, was that resolved, that bid process? And my other question is, if you could explain to the public this evening, in regards to your length of stay here in the city, and how that relates to your plan. Will the plan extend beyond your time here in the city? We can make a lot of changes and do it in a short period of time, and it will be very painful or we could make those changes over a, a much longer period of time and the pain would be much less. So if you could explain that to the <coughs> residents, uh, probably better than what I can. Thank you. Well, again, if you go back to the 11 criteria and nine that we were in violation of, I mean, if we can, again, put those on the right course, I think we can get the city back in the hands of the mayor and the city council. One thing I think, though, about long-term versus short-term is that, you know, up till now we've had, like, consent agreements, and then you violate the consent agreement, and then you go receivership. To me, there needs to be a mechanism on the other end where, as you come out of receivership, you sign a consent agreement that has triggers in it. So, you know, if local officials are not adhering to the plan, there's triggers to bring the state back in before you wait five years and you know get into a, a bigger problem. So that's one of the things I would suggest to the state that uh, would be important really on the way out of receivership to have some kind of consent decree. Terry Bank. Um, to the point, but a little bit of background. Uh, many of us are concerned what's going to happen after you leave. Um, I was born here, I grew up and went to school here. And we're embarrassed that we've had a financial receiver or bankruptcy twice under the current city charter. We think that that is not the only reason. There's uh, thousands of reasons, but it's something worth looking at. And we, you have a unique opportunity now to engage this entire community, because the people here are dug in deep. You're gonna have a five or 600 people that would love to be here and a couple hundred in the room at every one. And we're here, we're staying. But we think something's wrong with the way our city is organized. And you're going to correct the problems of the past for an immediacy, but then we're going to come back to the same chart. You have the opportunity to engage the entire community. I want you to exercise the power you have to step into the shoes of the council. I want you to consider putting on the ballot in August whether or not the city of Flint voters want a charter revision commission, and since you can step into the shoes of the council, you can cause the election of the members at the same time. I'm not running. <laughs> but what I will do is I'll put together a fundraising group to help fund this if you do it. Okay? Uh, I'll be begging a lot of people. But you have a unique opportunity. These people here are engaged. They want to be here. They want to help. We don't know how this happened. We're not blaming the mayor. We're not blaming the council. We're not blaming Obama. We're not blaming globalization. But it happened to us. And we want to come to the table and decide. Do we want to change the charter? Do we want to change it a little with some amendments? 
Or do we want to get rid of the strong mayor? Do we want to go to a city manager? Do we want five councilmen instead of nine? But allow nine good citizens to become elected to meet, and then you can go to that body and give them your vision of what it will take to keep your plan to have a history beyond your leave. Uh, will you do that? Uh, I will consider that. I can tell you it's a good suggestion, and I, I do believe we need to look at the charter. Uh, what I will say is that, uh, and certainly members of my team have been saying to me, you know, focus on what the immediate challenge is, but the charter revisions and certainly giving citizens a role in looking at that charter makes sense to me. So we can talk more about that. It's a good suggestion. I don't know the man that was just ahead of me, but I'm backing up what he's saying. The women, uh, the voters, have for a couple of years worked on revision of the charter. There's been hearings. I don't know what's happened to it. It seems to be spelled out someplace. But the work has already been done uh, toward taking away the strong uh, mayor system. We've lost our population and probably it hasn't been working very well for our city for about probably 20 years now. Um, that maybe we need to look at having a professional city manager that's not involved in politics and in the way that mayors end up being. I know that following what's going on in Detroit, very hard for a mayor who is political and wants to remain in power along with the city council that's been elected to make the kind of tough decisions that you're going to have to make because it isn't politically good for them. And I think that that's why they're resisting so hard in Detroit uh, about being taken over. Nobody wants to be taken over, but it's also involved. You've got to make those decisions and then everybody can take them. Again, uh, I think good suggestions, and we'll take a look at it. How are you doing today? Thanks. Um, my question is, is well, what are you going to do about um, Smith Village? You know, I'm trying to wrap my mind around 25 new houses and another uh, some odd 60 houses or so when there's houses and agencies, uh, Chodos, all over the community that they can't even lease. They're, they've taken federal funds to do these houses and they're still sitting idle. They put 80, 90, 100,000 in houses and I'm very much aware, because I work for Chodos, and they're still sitting there and they can't even lease the house or sell the house or anything. So how how does that add up? I can't wrap, wrap my mind around how you're gonna do be able to build more houses in the community. We're about the only place in the, in the whole country building houses. Voodoo economics. All right. uh, first of all, what I'd say is you're raising an issue of concern. Uh, Smith Village is an issue of concern. Uh, that is one of the committees I formed with some professionals in the community to look at that and give us some advice going forward. Uh, I think what, what I would say is that we're going to do our best to make sure that that's a success. Uh, we do have houses up and so we're challenged now to uh, make sure it's a success. I'll work with the Council, I'll work with the mayor and certainly the citizens to try to do that. 